Uh, thanks to all three organizers for organizing this wonderful meeting. Uh, let me do two confessions. There will be no non fermi liquid in this talk. There will be no self energy in this talk. So it will be simple talk about simple things, but uh, I hope you will enjoy. I enjoy it when we're doing this. So it's a combination of two works. Uh, and um, my goal will be to say that, to show that there is a lot of commonalities between two seemingly different phenomena. One will be superconductivity in bilayer graphene, untwisted, it's Bernard bilayer graphene. And second will be superconductivity in either pure or mostly doped iron selenium when you bring it to the point when pneumatic order disappears. So first work was done uh, with a uh, wonderful student of Leonid Levitov, uh, Zhidong, MIT, and with Leonid himself. And the second was done with my student, Kazi Islam, from uh, Minnesota. So the story. The story will be pretty straightforward. I don't want to consider electron-phonon interactions, so it will be superconductivity due to electron-electron interaction near the set of some other non-superconducting order. The story, which all of you heard many times, it's normally affiliated with Kohn-Lattinger mechanism or some modern version of Kohn-Lattinger mechanism. But uh, normally Kohn-Lattinger, conventional Kohn-Lattinger, is a story when you introduce, when you start with repulsive interaction, look at how this interaction is screened, introduce free daily oscillations, so interaction occasionally gets overscreened, and this is how you get, if you're lucky, attraction in non-S wave channels. This was all extended to going beyond lowest order and include series of graphs, which means uh, interaction mediated by either charge or spin degrees of freedom. But in all situations, it's superconductivity, which is not ordinary S wave. The closest case one can get is S plus minus for uh, iron based materials, which I will be talking about. But this S plus minus in name only. It's the same sign changing gap due to uh, interactions, which is essentially same um, over screening of the interaction. So what I will do, sorry, first of all, example. Examples are multiple and most known examples are probably most prominent examples are in heavy fermion materials when you can really see superconductivity emerging right near the very end of antiferromagnetic order. A little bit less prominent, but also well-known example of superconductivity uh, near the end of ferromagnetic order, and of course, cuprates and nictites with their magnetic order and potentially other orders are subject of discussions here. So what I will be doing, going back to what I was saying a minute ago, I'll be mostly talking about how one can possibly get conventional S-wave superconductivity. By conventional S-wave means that angular variation of the gap along Fermi surface will not play any role, as well as a possible sign change from one Fermi surface to the other. So to this respect, it will be a question how to get S wave from repulsion. In conventional con lattinger story goes like this. Yes, you can get attraction in non-S wave channel, but all the normalizations, if you look at the same normalization in S wave channels, they only make interaction more repulsive. Very good. So there will be two examples. And again, what I will try to do is to show commonalities between these two examples. One is, um, materials that is very popular now as the offshot of twisted bilayer graphene. This is non-twisted uh, bilayer graphene called Bernard bilayer graphene, it's AB stacking when the basically in the top layer, you take um, a position of the atom and go down and will be exactly in the middle of the hexagon in the lower layer. So this story was studied, this material was studied to death back when graphene was studied without twisting. And it's a famous story about quadratic band touching. The new element is that when you apply electric field called displacement field, you essentially start splitting excitations in two layers, but do it in a, but it turns out to be in a very intelligent way. Uh, the excitation gets split, there is a gap here, but you see there is a very flat top and sorry, very flat top of this dispersion, very flat bottom of this dispersion. So you start creating flat regions. It's by no means flat band. The bandwidth is void. But uh, there are regions when excitations are almost completely flat. And then on top of this, you can ask, where is the position of the minimum or the maximum? And this brings you to very 
nice phenomena that to zero approximation, if you don't want to look into all details, you just open up a small Fermi surface by doping either into conduction band or going into valence band, you open up a small Fermi surfaces located near K and K prime Dirac points in the brilliant zone. And there are two of them, two valleys, and they're degenerate by symmetry. Uh, the actual situation is more complicated and Eris was involved in more complicated analysis of the story. In fact, you open up for three small pockets then they merge through one whole point and then you get one larger Fermi surface. But even with that, or you just with the picture which I showed, have a situation when you have fermions with small Fermi surfaces and flat dispersion. It can be either, and therefore um, you expect that all effects of interaction will be enhanced because of flatness of the dispersion. If you go to one whole point, it's even further. You more enhance the effects of an interaction because density of states diverge. So when experiments were done, they did find a sequence of transitions. And uh, basically what, what experiment shows here is that you take particular displacement field and go from charge neutrality towards either doping into conduction bands or doping into valence bands. And then you see that the state of a system changes. And this is the reflection, basically, this quantum oscillation, which reflects how Fermi surfaces change. And contrary to what is uh, intuited by layer graphene, also the structure is, of transition is similar. You go from the uh, disordered state to ordered state, then back into disordered state, then back into the ordered state. So you see different orders appearing one after the other, not at the same time. And besides everything, let's talk about superconductivity. There is superconductivity near one of these orders. Let me put this phrase like this, one of these orders. Let's not specify the order at this moment. Uh, it's not as spectacular in this plot, this displacement field versus density. This is the region when uh, resistivity uh, vanishes, but it's more spectacular if you look at like this. There's the same cut and you go to lower temperature, you see that really uh, resistivity goes down below particular temperature in millikelvin. It's about 30 millikelvin. So obviously superconductivity emerges, let's go back to this slide, superconductivity emerges when the system is about to become ordered. So let's pretend that we're completely um, ignorant here and just uh, take agnostic point of view and ask first of all, what kind of orders you can have in this system, which brings us to the wonderful story. Let's keep minor, but not minor, Let's keep funny details. Namely, let's not assume that you have three small Fermi surfaces, merchants and point, et cetera. Let's just assume that we have one pocket near K prime point, one pocket near K point. And of course, by symmetry, there are three in the brilliant zone, K pockets and three K prime pockets. And in this respect, the problem to find orders is quite straightforward. We have two sets of fermions, one near K, one near K prime. Let's call them A and B fermions. And you ask what kind of bilinear and fermion order parameters can develop. It's completely bookkeeping process, how many of them you can write. And it turns out that you can write several combinations of A and B. They all have names, and some of them have more than one name. This was a source of confusion between theorists who were calling exactly the same in different uh, way. For example, charge density wave, A dagger B and B dagger A, with momentum K minus K prime was called simply charge density wave for spin singlet intervalic coherence orders. Same for spin. It's either spin density wave or spin triplet intervalic coherence order. It's all the same. But message here is simple. We have A and B fermions. You can think how many and A fermions are near K point, if B fermions near K prime point. You can ask how many bilinear combinations you can write. There are all of them. And if you ask how many order parameters you can write down, for example, if you have spin, you have three order parameters, can be along X, Y, and Z. If you have charge density wave or spin density wave, you simultaneously have a factor of two because order parameters is a complex variable. A dagger B is not the same as B dagger A. So you count the total number and you find the number is 15, which immediately brings the issue of SU4 symmetry. Number of generators of SU4 is four square minus one equal to 15. And it's not 
unusual because all stories about SU4 is when you have spin and extra variable. Here it's isospin. A and B is just like two components of isospin. So first of all, you can, sorry, yeah. Sorry, for it again. Uh, now, the standard way to search when any of these orders develop is you introduce formula, interaction between fermions, do, if you like, RPA-like calculations and find out when the corresponding susceptibility develops. And there are three interactions that you can write. This is interaction within one valley. This is density in one valley and density in the other valley. It's density, density, inter-valley interaction. And finally, there is exchange when you take fermion from one valley and bring to the other. And generally, these are interactions at small momentum transfer, this interaction with large momentum transfer, and because interaction is screened, this guy is normally much smaller than this two. And in most studies of either twisted or untwisted by layer graphene, this interaction is just simply emitted set to zero. And these two are taking it. And if you take this, and also take polarization operators with momentum zero and momentum k minus k prime, which is the same as 2k if you change by a uh, reciprocal lattice vector, then you find that you have exact SU4 symmetry, meaning that instability for all 15 order parameters occurs at the same point. And they have a wonderful point where Polarization, when u, the only interactions that you have in this problem after you set u1 equal to u2 and u3 is equal to zero, times polarization operator when this product is one, you get susceptibility which goes to infinity, which is nothing but standard stoner criteria for instability. I really didn't tell you anything that goes beyond stoner physics here, except that there are 15 components. What actually happens when you go beyond all this point and ask what kind of order develops? It depends on what is the structure of fourth order terms in Landau theory. And let's not go into this. I will not go into order state. I'll just take the approach order state. What I'm interested in here is what kind of pairing you may have very close to this SU4 instability. So we have a situation when I change either interaction or better to change, say I change polarization bubble because I change density. And at some point, the system develops instability. And I want to see, can I get superconductivity close to this instability? I will come to this problem in a few seconds. But before, I want to go back to ancient times and just remind you one thing that goes into old textbooks, how we can get superconductivity due to ferromagnetic fluctuation. Well, ancient times go this way. Take Hubbard model, take the simplest case, uh, one valley, one band. Hubbard model, and you want to ask what happens when the system approach for a magnetic transition and how one can possibly get superconductivity near this point. The reason I'm doing this, I want to emphasize one thing, that when we solve for superconductivity, we need to solve gap equation and find when this gap equation has non-trivial solution. And what we have here is not interaction. This is what we call anti-symmetrized interaction. Why? Because we have two fermions coming out, and interaction has two, end, two entry points, two formulas coming in, two coming out, and two formulas can go either straightforward to the interaction, to the interaction, or they can exchange. And because of this, every time when you solve for the superconductivity, you have two components of interaction taken together, one direct and the second one exchange when I, uh, when I interchange these two formulas. There are two components that normally depends on what momentum transfer is, but Real message here is because of exchange, we have different combination of spin indices. And combining these two guys together, you get renormalized original interaction, which was in chart channel. Original interaction was just Hubbard. It's just density, density interaction. But you also get a component, which is product of two spins. And this is how you get effective spin interaction in superconducting problem, by just using this um, anti-symmetrized interaction. And long story short, then you do theory kitchen, you do ladders, bubbles, maximally cross diagrams, all the story that everyone can do uh, with if the spare time. And then what you get is the standard result, which you can see in textbooks, that there are two components of pairing interaction dress. One comes from exchange of charge fluctuations, 
combination of spin delta function means it's a chart channel. And another one is a combination of spin indices. And it goes with the factor of one minus u. And you immediately realize that one minus u is nothing but stoner criteria of ferromagnetism. And you also realize that there is a minus sign here. And this is a classic story how you get attraction due to ferromagnetic fluctuation. You calculate um, anti-symmetrized interaction, do it by properly adding up all polarization bubble with zero momentum transfer. Actually, all these calculations is exact. If you only take polarization bubble with zero momentum transfer, then you don't miss anything. You just neglect a lot of stuff with polarization bubbles with finite momentum transfer. But in this fact, this result is exact. And you get a standard result that pairing that near a ferromagnetic instability, you get effective attraction in a channel mediated by spin fluctuations. And this channel is spin triplet, obviously, because um, this is uh, basically, yeah, this is spin channel. Uh, and uh, then you can do the same with anti ferromagnetic fluctuation, just to say a word. And then you get a standard story about attraction and D wave channel mediated by anti ferromagnetic spin fluctuation. This will be spin single. Why I tell you this? Because back to our story. So we have SU4 instability, a lot of order parameters, a lot of possible directions for the ordering. But we have one interesting aspect we don't have exchange. Exchange in our case would be transforming from one valley to the other valley. We set this interaction to zero. As a result, we don't get spin component of the interaction. We can renormalize charge component with sum up bubbles, blah, 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 but we never get spin part. And not surprisingly, what comes out near this instability that when you do calculations, you find out that interaction gets enhanced. That's a stoner criteria. So you expect, yes, that there will be denominator that knows about stoner instability but the sign is plus and it's only in chart channel. So you have enhanced interaction, which nevertheless remains completely repulsive. And so the question is, can it, does it mean that the problem is really very bad for superconductivity? Well, the first approximation, it is very bad. It's repulsive interaction. And then the question is, can we still do something here? Can we extract superconductivity out of this? It's really even not nominal. This really repulsive interaction. There is nothing to do about this. I mean, that it's not like interaction acquires some other components that can be taken as attractive. No, it's just a constant interaction, which feels instability. It gets enhanced when the system approaches instability, but there is no attractive component. So we look at experiment. And in experiment, we see interesting features. This is the same data that I showed you before, but enhanced and it did in different color coding. This density, uh, and this is not, it's a for fixed displacement field. What I have along vertical axis is an in-plane magnetic field. So that's Zeeman field, when there is no um, orbital effect. And then you see that superconductivity does emerge. This is your superconductivity. But it emerges only at a finite field. And in fact, if you go to small fields, there is nothing. So it's just like there is a critical field for superconductivity. Superconductivity emerges as the critical field goes up and then disappears at high field. And so let's do the same as we were doing, but uh, this is the same plot, but in a more nicer way. At zero field, there is nothing. And if you go to finite field, you clearly see that there is a uh, reduction of resistivity. So, yeah. Yeah, there is, you see this red region here, yes. We can talk about this, but it's, it has nothing to do with superconductivity. Yeah. It's a dozen possible another order. We have some ideas what it is, but yeah. OK. So let's now play a simple game. So what we'll do. This our interaction. The same one that I had before, I just rewrote in a more simple way. It's repulsive constant divided by to, to the distance to the critical point. One minus u pi is nothing but the distance to a critical point. And now applying plane magnetic field. Once you apply ZM in the magnetic field, you split distance to a critical point. Fermions with spin up and spin down with respect to the field now have different polarization operation, obviously. And therefore, fermions with one spin projection come to instability first. 
So let's assume that it's spin up just to split the difference. And so you split interaction. How you split interaction? This can be worked out very easily. Now I have to go back to how you get the original result and redo everything uh, in the presence of magnetic field. And so you found that there are two components of the interaction, one with spin up, up, another with spin, spin down, down. And the one with up, up is just as it was before. This interaction, which keeps increasing, diverges when delta up, the one that becomes zero first really goes to zero. It's repulsive, strong repulsive interaction. But when you look at the another one, you find interesting situations that this becomes non-monotonic behavior. And in particular, it's exactly the point where instability occurs. Interaction in other channel goes to zero. In fact, still repulsive. Everything is repulsive, but non-monotonic. Now you say, aha, if it's non-monotonic, let's try to do something more sophisticated. Let's go back and introduce Landau dumping. Let's introduce uh, Q dependence of the interaction. This is what we normally do with the interaction near a critical point. So do standard things. Before we discussed only the delta term, there is, of course, Q dependence when Q is a deviation from zero. And of course, there's Landau dumping, which give you frequency dependence. And then you get it's really two lines. You get interaction like this. You calculate the momentum averaged interaction because really we are interested in S wave. So you need momentum average of the interaction. And long story short, what you find as a function of frequency, which is here, you find that interaction is non-monotonic. This interaction first goes up when frequency goes down, passes through a maximum and then goes down. It can be done spectacularly for one particular limit of small dispersion or less spectacular, but anyway, interaction is non-monotonic. And then you ask, aha, uh -huh. everything is repulsive, but non-monotonic. So you solve for the gap. Gap equation, there is a minus sign because everything is repulsive and you want to solve this equation, and it turns out that this equation has a solution. And solution predictably is like this. Since your interaction is peaked at finite frequency, it's completely repulsive, but peaked at finite frequency, you play exactly the same game as we used to play for, say, D-wave superconductivity. We say that the gap function changes sign when you change frequency between, say, zero and position of the maximum. So you get sign-changing solution for the gap, which is in fact shown here as a result of exact solution of this equation. And this physics has a threshold. So there's a threshold on the field. There's a critical field when superconductivity appears and passes through a maximum and then goes down. And that's some behavior of how DC goes as a function of gap. And this is quite consistent with experiment in this respect. There is a finite threshold then the superconductivity goes up and then disappears. And I want to quickly emphasize, let me just put this slide still together besides this last part, that this is something that is textbook example. And I don't know whether Pierce is here, but this was in Pierce's book. Uh, it's a situation how you get S-wave superconductivity for electron phonon interaction in the presence of much stronger Coulomb repulsion, or if you like to this extent, Hubbard repulsion. You never get attractive interaction. If you read in textbooks that interaction becomes attractive at low frequencies, throw out this book. Uh, interaction always remains repulsive, but uh, it becomes frequency dependent. And because of electron phonon interaction, it gets down at low frequencies. So when you solve for the gap in this situation, yes, you get superconductivity, which is plus minus, it changes sign between small and harsh frequencies. And the standard Macmillan story of superconductivity with lambda minus mu star is when you originally start with two by two gap equation, high and low frequencies, and integrate out high energy fermions and only deal with low frequency fermions. The remark I want to make here is just out of fun, that what I showed you before, the sign changing gap and this superconductivity is in fact topological superconductivity. Um, and the reason is very simple. This is a situation when on Matsubara frequency, the gap changes sign. You see it here, you saw it in the picture which I showed you before. All calculations are done in Matsubara frequency. And every time the gap changes sign on Matsubara frequency, this is the point of dynamical vortex. If you take the same gap function in a complex plane, then this point on the Matsubara axis, when the gap changes sign, 
If you make a circle around this point, you get a phase change by two pi. So it's a dynamical vortex. And there is a consequence of this. You may say, wow, what the hell, the dynamical vortex in Matsubara axis, experiments are done on real axis. But it turns out that every word, every gap, uh, sorry, every vortex on Matsubara axis give rise to phase topological phase sleep of a gap, of a phase of the gap along real axis between infinite frequency and zero frequency by a factor of pi or between minus infinity and infinity by two pi. So there is a phase sleep coming out of sign change on Matsubara axis. And in this respect, it's a topological effect. So anyway, keep going. Yeah. No, 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 what happens? There are two possibilities. Either, either the gap closes, which means that vortex that you have in Matsubara axis, and there is, because gap function is symmetric on Matsubara axis, there is another vortex and negative Matsubara axis. They come close to each other and they merge, and this is where gap closes. Or what really happens if you go from purely attractive interaction to interaction which becomes repulsive, vortex come from infinity. And vortex started, vortex appears at infinity and then start coming down. There are two possibilities. So there is a third one when there are two zeros and two vortices come on the positive Matsubara axis, they merge together and then they split along uh, in the complex plane and then they can disappear into lower half plane. This is the third possibility. Yeah. No, 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 I'm just going to. I'm saying that if you have stronger Coulomb interactions, that yes, there is, a, yeah, there is, yeah. Well, if you find the ARPES person who will be willing and capable to measure, it's measurable effect, but what you need for this, you need to measure real and imaginary part of the gap. They have one measurement, so which means that you need to do measurements in the large frequency range to do Kramer's chronic. If there is enough frequency range, and you can do Kramer's coinings, then you can extract phase of the gap along real axis. Then try to look. Of course, you don't need infinity. In fact, the size, the, the accumulation of phase by pi happens at typical frequencies, which are relevant for phase. There was one attempt to do this by uh, people from Borisenko group in Dresden, when they tried to uh, do measurements in a wide enough range and extract phase, but they didn't look precisely into this. Yeah. Okay, in the interest of time, let me move on a little. So first of all, you may say, well, you're talking about magnetic field. There is another experiment. Another experiment tells you that, you know, there is superconductivity in non-twisted by Bernard by layer, by layer graphene without any magnetic field. Yes, there was a second experiment done in Caltech. And this experiment shows that, yes, there is superconductivity, same arrangement, but zero magnetic field, but, it's BBG on a monolayer of uh, W selenium 2. And then you see pretty much the same behavior. It's a non, uh, with the applied magnetic field, you find that it's not Pauli limited uh, superconductivity. So it's a triplet, but then you see interesting phenomena. There is a, uh, uh, a monolayer and uh, bilayer graphene below it. And when you split by displacement field, you essentially split two layers. This portion becomes flat because of interaction between layers, but you essentially split them. And you get superconductivity only in a layer which is closer to um, monolayer. So, and the people of this work suggested rightly that this is because a uh, monolayer of molybdenum um, selenium two, oh, sorry, molybdenum was wrong, right? W selenium uh, introduces Ising spin orbit. And once you have Ising spin orbit, you have exactly the same situation when I showed you before. Now you have splitting. Now it looks that you have two fermions, one with spin up, with another with spin down that are, have equal energies. And you have two other fermions with different energies and they have the same story. Have interaction which has two components, one with say up down spin red blue up red up and then for up down spin when blue up and uh, when you compare this with what i told you about the field 
you find that this is the same. And the reasoning is very simple. It looks like in one case you get up, up, in another case you have up, down, but don't forget that up is along Z axis here. While in the other one, up, down is along X because you take a field in the plane. So there are different field directions if you like. And long story short, you solve these two problems, you get exactly the same result. Sign changing superconductivity because of spin orbit coupling. And moreover, when you combine this spin orbit along Z and magnetic field along X, you find out that the degeneracy between two Fermi surface remains. So it's again, not Pauli limited superconductivity, it's just like triplet in this case. So in this respect, the two experiments show you the same. Either magnetic field or spin orbit introduces extra stuff, which makes repulsive interaction non-monotonic. And once a repulsive interaction becomes non-monotonic, you can get solution for the gap with one caveat, it's sign changing as a function of frequency. Very good. Now the next question. This is great. We applied magnetic field, we applied extra source and get superconductivity. But remember, originally it was repulsive interaction. So now I want to ask a different question. And this will be linked to the second part of the talk if I have time to give it. Uh, can we get superconductivity without a field and without spin orbit? And on the first hand, you can say, well, of course, no, because I just told you, you go to SU4 symmetric point, interaction enhanced, but gets complete, remains completely repulsive. What I want to do is what I to ask a question, what happens when I change conditions a little bit? I go a little bit away from SU4 symmetric point and I keep all three interactions that I had. Remember there was density density interaction for one valley, density density interaction between valleys and exchange interaction from one valley to another. There is nothing else if you have just two valley problems. So the answer is actually yes. And let me do this. So once I solve the full problem, I don't do anything fancy here. I just introduce three interactions, do the same ladder bubbles, maximally cross diagram story, and I obtain a set of instabilities for each potential order out of this former combination of 15 orders or elements of 15 orders. I now have my own instability condition. So I split them a little bit. If I go back to SU4 symmetric points when polarization operators are the same, U1 is equal to U2, U3 is equal to zero, I get the same condition for all of them. And then I go into theory kitchen and ask a question. I'm close to one of these transitions. I'm very close to one of these transitions. What do I get? And it turns out that in all situation, I spare you from diagrammatics, et cetera, et cetera. It turns out that for all situation, you can say, well, interaction is mediated by fluctuations of the order parameter, which is about to develop, which seems reasonable, but I don't know about the, this is like a theorem. Each time we have to prove this by brute force, by just doing calculations. And believe me, it's not that trivial. thing. But the long story short, the result is as expected. It means how many, three minutes left? Aha, uh -huh. okay, then I don't have a second part. Okay, uh, okay, very good. So uh, let me finish with the first part. Uh, near valley, what's valley polarization? It's when density of one valley becomes not equal to the density of the other valley. Charge density wave is basically A dagger B with, without spin indices. The rest is ferromagnetism, anti-ferromagnetism, and spin density wave. These are all possible instability. So near any charge instability, interaction is mediated by charge fluctuation. Near each spin instability, interaction is mediated by spin fluctuations. It's a boring phrase, but again, I don't know theorem, which will tell us that it's always the case. You need to do calculations here. You look at experiments. We can discuss all cases as we did in the paper, but let's look at experiment. Remember there was superconductivity near one of these transitions. You can look a little bit clo more closer what experiments actually tell you in terms of reconstruction of the Fermi surface in the ordered state. And then there's selection. Selection is that most likely it's either valley polarization or magnetism. Basically this is the, I said, some state close to which system develops uh, superconductivity. Now there's a little bit more, more accurate phrase. The state is either valley polarization charge order or spin order. Well, let's look at this. If you have valley polarization, you look what happens with the effective interaction. 
No difference with SU4. It's the same story. I have to apply magnetic field or spin orbit to get superconductivity. But without this, I'll get enhanced interaction, but it's completely positive, means repulsive. So it's the same result as with SU4. I just do it a little bit more accurate. Very good. But if you have interaction mediated by spin fluctuation, then the story becomes different. First of all, because in order, remember, in order to get spin component of interaction, we need exchange. We need anti-symmetrized component of the interaction. Anti-symmetrization, another case means that you go from one valley to the other. So you have to introduce interaction with inter-valley momentum transfer. It's a new element. And with this new element, what you get is the interaction which behaves pretty much the same as in a system with one value, namely near a ferromagnetic instability, you pick up minus sign, there is attraction in spin triplet channel for intervalley antiferromagnetism. Interaction is formally repulsive, but we know how this formal repulsion works in a spin case. There is a hidden minus one due to spin component of the interaction. And if you work it out for superconductivity, you find that it's attractive and spin singlet channel. And let me say one phrase here. I say the word spin triplet, spin singlet, and it looks like spin triplet should be P wave. No, spin triplet is S wave because I have two values. And by what I didn't say, I should say from the very beginning, that if K is from one value, by symmetry minus K is another value. So your, two, your pair of fermions in the superconducting state is always A dagger, B dagger. And then this, there is an extra isospin index between A and B. So when we say spin triplet, it means S wave, but a valley triplet. When we say spin singlet, it means S wave, but valley singlet. So what we, in one valley is taken care of by introducing angular dependence of the gap function, here is take, taken care of by taking either um, either spin singlet or either spin triplet combination. So basically symmetric or asymmetric with the interchange of A and B for me. Okay, so again, looking at experiments, this is superconductivity is not Pauli limited, so it selects ferromagnetism. And I stop here probably because there were suggestions that maybe superconductivity here is due to ferromagnetic fluctuations. And my answer is it's possible. There is attraction, but then if we take seriously the fact that it appears only at finite magnetic field, of course, this superconductivity is the largest when magnetic field is zero. And I obviously don't have time to talk about the second part, but give me 30 seconds. For 30 seconds, I will just tell you one simple thing. Uh, if you look carefully in the formulas which I showed to you, let's go back for a second and very quickly. Yeah. So this was interaction in a spin triplet channel mediated by ferromagnetic fluctuations. And I formally said U3 equal to zero. I get final result. And I told you, it only comes about because of U3. So how come it be? So short answer is this very quickly. First of all, this is impossible, but at the same time, it's possible. The reasoning is this one. Yes, interaction is formally independent of the origin, but it turns out this way, that the U3 selects narrow range where the interaction goes from repulsive to attractive. And when you are in this range, U3 cancels out and you get interaction which is independent on the source, which reasoning is that TC is small. Of course it's small because the width is small. And when U3 goes to zero, the width goes to zero, but there is no smallness in the exponent. It's only smallness in the prefect. Great. I was supposed to talk about two things, obviously, I managed to talk about one, okay. I'll have a talk in different place next week then I will be only talking about the other thing. So let me very quickly give you a summary of this first part. Summary of this first part is this one. There is a, first of all, it's a wonderful playground. Even two valleys give you a lot of opportunities, new opportunities for superconductivity. And here the story is that there is a large number of possible orders. Total number is 15, although some of course are degenerate by symmetry. And when you look at the pairing interaction, then for all cases, no matter what kind of order developed, we proved that the pairing interaction very close to this to transition 
is proportional to susceptibility of the corresponding order parameter. So you have formally divergent pairing susceptibility. The question attractive or repulsive. If the system is SU4 symmetric, if you take conditions when the system is SU4 symmetric, this is the easiest condition you can make, you get this enhanced interaction, but it's completely repulsive, and you need extra features like either magnetic field or spin orbit coupling, and then you get superconductivity. If you break the restriction of SU4 symmetry, then you do get channels where extra exchange component create attractive interaction. It's like initial interaction is completely repulsive plus a term which is formally proportional to U3 squared times susceptibility of the corresponding order parameter. You work out details, you find that U3 cancels out. Good. And uh, this is pretty much it. Thanks.